Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Rob Shola, and I serve as the Bannon Faculty Fellow in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education. As you know, the goal of the Ignatian Center is to advance the Jesuit Catholic tradition of education here at Santa Clara as we strive to promote uh, the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life. This year, the Bannon Institute has focused on a provocative and quite powerful question. What good is God? Today's speakers are two faculty members uh, who received a Bannon Institute research grant to support their important inquiry into the question, what good is God for grief and loss? Surprisingly, little empirical research has addressed the impact of religious belief on how people experience and cope with personal loss and death. Their academic perspectives and methods of inquiry reflect an interdisciplinary dialogue between philosophy and uh, psychology. Today, Professors David Feldman and Robert Gresses will report on their research into the role of religious belief in times of profound loss and death within lay philosophy faculty, Jesuit priests, and undergraduate students. David Feldman is Associate Professor in Counseling Psychology here at Santa Clara University where he teaches courses in Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, Brief Psychotherapies, and Personality Theory. Dave earned his PhD in Clinical Psychology at the University of Kansas and completed a Health Psychology Fellowship at the VA Healthcare Center in Palo Alto, California. His research and writings have addressed such topics as hope, meaning, and growth in the face of physical illness, trauma, and other highly stressful events. He is a co-author of the text entitled The End of Life Handbook, A Compassionate Guide to Connecting with and Caring for a Dying Loved One. Robert Gresses is an associate professor of philosophy at Cal State University in Northridge. He completed his PhD from the University of Michigan and his research and teaching center on Kant, the philosophy of religion, ethics, moral psychology, free will, and the history of modern philosophy. He is the author of How to Be Evil, Kant's Moral Psychology of Immorality, which is found in Rethinking Kant, Current Trends in North American Kantian Scholarship. Please join me this afternoon in welcoming our distinguished speakers as they reflect with us on the topic, What Good is God for Grief and Loss? Psychology Meets Philosophy, an Interdisciplinary Research Study. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Yeah, this is the first time in a long time I've been called distinguished. I'm very pleased by that. The last time was when I had a beard. So, okay. We're talking, as you can see, about what good is God for grief and abuse of death. And let me tell you about the impetus behind this project. So, there's this view that was named in about 1999, but that was more formally presented in an article in 2004 by a philosopher named uh, Georges Ray. I don't know if that's George or Georges. I've never met the man. But uh, we'll just call him George Ray, or just Ray. And here's meta-atheism. Here's how he describes it. Despite appearances, most Western adults who've been exposed to standard science and claim to believe in God are self-deceived. At some level, they think the belief is false. That's from his article, Meta-Atheism, Religious Avowal as Self-Deception. So as you can see from that quote, meta-atheism consists of two claims. First, educated Westerners who avow theism believe atheism. And second, educated Westerners who avow theism believe they believe theism, but they are self-deceived. So, 
Those are the two claims. So it's worth noting the distinction between believing something and avowing something, right? So you avow something when you say you believe it, when you say this is my view, when you even think of yourself that that's your view. But you believe something when it's sort of true of you on a deeper level that that is your view. It's perfectly possible to avow something without believing it. I might avow to you that I'm seven feet tall, but I don't believe it, neither do you. So, this is a pretty bold pair of claims. Most people who think they believe in God, in fact, don't. They just don't know they don't. That's pretty bold. Now, you might think, that's also pretty newfangled sounding. Who is this guy? Turns out, he is not the first person to make a claim like this. In fact, somebody earlier than him is the very famous philosopher David Hume, who made a claim similar to this in 1757 in his book, The Natural History of Religion. Hume writes, we may observe that, notwithstanding the dogmatical, imperious style of all superstition, the conviction of the religionists in all ages is more affected than real, and scarcely ever approaches in any degree to that solid belief and persuasion which governs us in the common affairs of life. Men dare not to avow, even to their own hearts, the doubts which they entertain on such subjects. They make a, a merit of implicit faith and disguise to themselves their real infidelity by the strongest asseverations and most positive bigotry. The usual course of men's conduct belies their words. So that's Hume defending a thesis pretty similar to Ray's. But interestingly, it's not just people who are skeptical of religion who avow that atheism. Here's another person, Sir Kierkegaard, who is known as a Christian philosopher. He writes, Nowadays, we can become or live as Christians in the most pleasant way and without ever risking the slightest possibility of offense. All we have to do is start with the status quo and observe good virtues. We can continue to make ourselves comfortable by scraping together the world's goods as long as we stir into the pot what is Christian as a seasoning, an ingredient that almost serves to refine our enjoyment of life. This kind of Christianity is but a religious variation of the world's unbelief, a movement without budging from the spot. That is to say, it is a simulated motion. So note that. If you're a meta-atheist, you're not saying that God doesn't exist, though you might be saying that. What's most central to being a meta-atheist is saying that most people who think they believe in God are self-deceived. So you could think there is a God, and a lot of people go around saying they believe in him, but they're just tricking themselves. That seems to be Kierkegaard's view. Okay. Now, as I said, it's a pretty bold view. So why would somebody believe it? So here are two reasons. The first reason is going to be one that Kierkegaard doesn't share, but it's one that Hume and Ray might share, which is this. Theism is implausible. Here's what Ray says. Were the claims about a supernatural entity who loves, commands, scolds, forgives, and so forth to be encountered in a fashion removed from the rich, respectable aesthetic and cultural traditions in which they are standardly presented, they would be widely regarded as psychotic. <laughs> Pretty bold statement. Um, so, in other words, let me sort of unpack that a bit. What he's saying is this. As far as he's concerned, belief that God exists is such an unlikely belief that if somebody says they believe it and they're in the least bit apprised of current science, they must be posing. They must not really believe that, because it's just too crazy a view. It's like saying that you believe evolutionary theory, you know all about the Big Bang and contemporary physics, and also you believe in goblins. It would strike somebody who, said, who, who heard that as a very strange combination of beliefs, and so thinks Ray. You wouldn't actually believe that the person who said they believe in goblins really believes it. Similarly, he thinks, you shouldn't believe that somebody who says they believe in something as outrageous as God actually believes it. The second reason is of more interest to us, though. Here's the second reason. People don't behave as though they believe theism is true. Another quote from Ray. Most people's reactions and behavior, for example, grief, mourning at a friend's death, do not seem seriously affected by the claimed prospects of a hereafter. Now, this is one of a few kinds of examples that he gives about ways in which the supposedly religious act just the same as the non-religious. But the point is basically that, look, if you say you believe in God, 
and that you believe in an afterlife, and that you believe this afterlife is one where everybody will go to heaven, then you should act considerably differently from somebody who says there is no God and there is no afterlife. For instance, if somebody you love dies and you think they've gone to heaven, you should not be sad. You should be happy. After all, they're in heaven enjoying endless glory. Um, but he thinks people who believe in God don't really act like that. And he also adds, if they did, we would really think they're crazy. So it almost seems like a heads I wouldn't tell you lose to you, but nevertheless, those, that's why he believes that atheism. Now, I think there are some problems with that atheism. So I have two responses at first. First is I just disagree that theism is implausible. Um, there's lots of very smart philosophers, just as good or better than George Ray, who give, I think, very sophisticated arguments for theism. And they're about as good as any philosophical argument gets, in the sense that most philosophical arguments don't really change people's minds very often, but they do often help to make sense of a view so you can see why somebody might believe it, and so you can see it's reasonable. And I think arguments for theism are very reasonable. But here's the more important part. Even if it was really implausible, the fact that it's implausible, if it were a fact, shouldn't lead you to conclude that people who say they believe it don't really believe it. So I'm going to give you a really implausible view. It's called birtherism. Birtherism is the view that Barack Obama is not an American citizen, that his birth certificate is forged, that he was really born in Kenya, and so on and so forth. There are a disturbingly high number of birthers. But one thing I never hear about birthers is they don't believe it. They believe it. That's the problem. It's a very implausible view, and they do believe it. I don't think they're necessarily stupid either. Some probably are, but some seem to be smart enough. In fact, I know a pretty prominent philosopher who, although not a birther, is a truther. Right? He thinks 9-11 was an inside job. He thinks that the Bush administration decided to destroy the two towers. Again, this is a conspiracy theory. It's pretty implausible, but you can be smart and believe it. And when you believe it, we don't say, oh, they must be pretending. Second response. Second response is that I don't know that it is true that religious people act in the same way as non-religious people. Now, George Ray, as you might expect, is a very empirical guy, and yet he gives no empirical evidence for his claim that the religious act just the same as non-religious. It almost makes you wonder, does he really believe empiricism? <laughs> or is it just a pose? But nevertheless, we're going to look at the evidence that the religious, in fact, act differently from the non-religious, at least when it comes to the issue of grief. And to that end, we need somebody who's good at evidence, a psychologist, not a philosopher. So Dave, <laughs> your turn. So there's this, um, can you hear me okay? Because yeah. I'm gonna walk around, because I need to like point to the slides and stuff, and besides, I'm just a nervous pacer. Um, there is this new field of philosophy called X5, experimental philosophy. And it came about, I think, when philosophers who often say it is typical for people to believe this, or this is just sort of an obvious claim to sort of start with premises, it has been typical for philosophers to use these sorts of premises for years. But there is a recent movement that says maybe we should test and see if those premises are actually true using empir empirical methodology. So this is really what I'm about to present you is really a study in experimental philosophy, which in other words is philosophers pretending to be psychologists. <laughs> uh, and so that's what we're going to that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, so, uh, as Rob was talking about, there are really two. Does this keep cutting out? Um, is it? As Rob was talking about, there are really two. This is annoying. <laughs> no, we can hear you. You can. You're okay. I'm just going to yeah, go. There are really two uh, questions that um, we want to explore. Um, one of them is. Does having some form of religious or spiritual belief, as opposed to having none, matter for two things? One of them is people's level of death anxiety. Again, if, if you are in that atheist, you would say that religious beliefs don't matter. So it should be that religious believers are not any more or less afraid to die than religious non-believers. Um, Rob and I have a different view. Our hypothesis is, in fact, that these religious beliefs, as opposed to none, matters. And that, in fact, people who are religious believers should be less afraid of death, less afraid of their mortality, than people who are non-religious. That's a testable hypothesis. Second of all, does having some form of religious belief, as opposed to none, 
matter for people's experience of grief. Again, we're going to claim that, in fact, it probably does. That having lost someone, if you're a religious person, that loss still hurts, perhaps, but perhaps the grief is softer, it is processed more effectively, etc., than among non-believers. This is a pretty gross, general level kind of research question. It's an on or off thing. It's saying that there are people who are believers, and there are people who are non-believers. But the truth is, I think we can ask much more specific questions. Like, do the specifics of those religious or spiritual beliefs matter for either or both of these outcomes, for death anxiety and for grief, right? Because thinking about the believers that you know, there's a great diversity in belief. And you can imagine that some beliefs might give us great comfort, and other beliefs may give us less comfort in times of loss. In fact, some beliefs may be toxic. And I think that's something that we need to explore if we're going to explore this question. So those are the two questions that we're going to try to answer uh, with some data today. So I want to tell you about the basics of the study. Um, Ron Shola mentioned that uh, the study that we intend to perform is a bigger study. We actually intend to ask these questions and explore these questions in different groups of people who avow versus do not avow religious faith. Like we like to do this sort of study in Jesuit priests. We'd also like to do this sort of study in a group of highly atheist people who are uh, philosophy professors, of one Rob is, is not, he's a philosophy professor, but not an atheist. Um, but for now, we just wanted to collect some pilot data. And so we ended up doing a national survey uh, of uh, people who live in the U.S. And we asked them, uh, all across the U.S., this is an online survey, we asked them questions that fall, fell into three categories. We asked them questions about their religious and spiritual beliefs, about their attitudes about death. So things like not only their fear of death, but also how much time do they spend trying to avoid the topic of death? Or are they willing to accept the idea that they're mortal? Psychologists have long said that the idea of accepting that you're mortal is a healthy thing. It's a good thing. Because if you accept that you're mortal and your time is limited, it helps you to focus on what's really important in life and make your life happy. Um, we also look at grief um, by asking people if they have lost someone in the recent past and trying to gather information about their grief. Um, we used a data collection method, which is Amazon Mechanical Turk. Has anybody heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk? If you haven't, it's very interesting, so I want to tell you about it. This has been widely used. I mean, it is the new hot thing in psychological and social science research. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk is an online service that's run by Amazon.com. And it's an international online labor marketplace. Um, and it's just what it sounds like. Prospective employers, in this case, me and Rob, uh, would post a task that we need done and a price we're willing to pay for that task to be done. So big box stores, for instance, have used Amazon Mechanical Turk by scanning in receipts, customer receipts, and then paying people a few bucks to put those custom, customer receipts in different categories. This is something that computers are still not very good at, but it turns out people are really good at. So it's a way of paying a small amount to have a small task done. Social science researchers have done basically this exact same thing, but with survey research. So what we did was we posted a survey, and we said, if you take this 20 to 30 minute survey, we will pay you $5. Psychologists have been doing this kind of survey research and paying about $5 for a very long time. The nice thing about Amazon's Mechanical Turk is it allows us to have national reach very, very quickly. So let me tell you about the people who answered our survey. There were 101 people, not huge, but we're continuing to collect data. And by the way, this data is hot off the press. We collected this five days ago is when it finished. I analyzed it two days ago. It took me 24 hours almost to analyze it. Um, these results are preliminary. I consider this a pilot study. We're going to continue to do a lot more research in the future. Um, the sample is 101 people, 55 males, 46 females, so nicely balanced. They were an average of 29 years of age, and a nice age range, 19 to 57. It's, it's one of the nice things about Amazon, using Amazon to gather this data, is you get a pretty representative age range. Obviously, we don't have anybody over 57. Mm -hmm. But psychologists are famous for doing pilot research with a captive audience that we have access to, and that is college students, at least their college professors do. And that's a really biased sample. It's people who are only in college, who are 18 and 19 years old. Uh, and this is uh, a much better uh, sample. 
Uh, ethnically, we have uh, mostly white, but we also have uh, some representation of African American, Asian American, uh, Latino, and East Indian. Education uh, is uh, probably above average. Uh, 82 of the 101 had some college. I think 64 of the 101 had completed some kind of degree, at least an associate's degree. So this is a little above the national average, which is typical of, of Amazon's Mechanical Turk because it's an online marketplace. So people with more education <laughs> tend to use online uh, more, even, even now in the 21st century, uh, because of disparities between social economic class, et cetera. But it's not too far off from the national norm. Um, location was in 34 states, so a nice, nice representation, and evenly spread across these 34 states. So we have what I'm comfortable calling the national norm. Uh, 52 of the 101 said that they had professed that they had a religious or spiritual belief, and 49 said they did not. Um, so about an even split. Yeah. 71% said they had lost someone uh, to death, because of death, in the last 10 years, and 30 said no. So we have plenty of people to survey about, um, about lost experiences of grief. So this is who we're talking about here. I think it's a sample that we can safely generalize to a wider group of people from, because it's reasonably representative, though not um, The survey, I'm not gonna talk much about this slide, but here are the survey, lots of different surveys uh, that we asked them, lots of questions, a uh, couple hundred <laughs> questions. Um, I just wanna say that all of these surveys are valid and reliable instruments that psychologists have used for a very long time. So I think we can trust their results. Uh, they fell into three categories. We asked about death anxiety, we asked about grief, and we asked about uh, religiosity. If you're curious what the religiosity questions are, they sort of fell into three categories. We asked about religious participation, so how often do you participate in organized and non-organized religious activities. Uh, we asked about views of God in the afterlife, and we asked about general religious orientation, things like intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, religiosity, which I'll define and talk about in a few minutes. So that's our survey. So let's look at the results. So our question that I asked, uh, the first one was, does having some form of religious or spiritual belief, as opposed to none, uh, matter for death anxiety? So again, the meta-atheists would say, no, it shouldn't matter, right? Because we don't really believe, religious believers don't really believe what they claim to believe. So they should be just as afraid of death as, as not believers, right? Whereas we hypothesize the opposite, we hypothesize, in fact, that, that, that in fact, having a religious belief should be comforting. You should, have, you should have less fear of death as a result of those religious beliefs than uh, non-believers. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, we found that people who profess belief in religion do not appear to have less fear of death than non-believers. But we shouldn't stop there, because this, the survey that we used of death anxiety actually had several sub-surveys within it. And some of those sub-surveys asked questions about the degree to which we avoid thinking about and talking about death, right? Um, we might expect, expect that religious believers would avoid the topic less, right? That they're more willing to engage with it and, and talk about it. That they're more willing to accept mortality. Because what comes after death isn't quite as scary. Um, and in fact, we do find that that religious believers do appear to more readily accept their mortality, at least in some ways. So I want to give you some data to back this up. So here we have what's called approach acceptance. I'll explain what that is in a second. And here we have the non-believers and the believers. And you can see that the people who profess no religious belief have much lower levels of approach acceptance than the religious believers. For the statistics geeks in the audience, this is a statistically significant difference with a large effect size. Uh, let me tell you what approach acceptance means. Approach acceptance means you accept your mortality. You don't shy away from it. You don't deny it. You don't repress it. You embrace the fact that you're mortal and you're going to die. Because you see death as ultimately a good thing. That whatever comes after it is ultimately serves a good purpose. There's something good in it. It doesn't necessarily mean that you believe in a heaven. It simply means that you see it as somehow positive in the long run. And it makes sense that people who have religious belief should believe that. They should practice approach acceptance more than non-believers. There is another kind of acceptance, which is called escape acceptance. And I know these bars don't look very different, but there is actually a reliable, statistically significant difference there. 
the religious believers tend to have slightly more escape acceptance than the non-believers. Let me tell you what escape acceptance is. Um, it's not quite as good as approach acceptance. Escape acceptance means accepting your mortality, accepting that death is a part of life, and believing that it's good. Right? So it sounds like approach acceptance. Except for you don't believe that death is good because you believe that death is inherently a positive thing. You believe death is good because you believe the world is terrible. <laughs> and so it's what's called escape acceptance. Death is good because it's a welcome respite from a broken world. It doesn't mean you're suicidal. It simply means that you look forward to it because you get to escape this sort of terrible existence we live. Um, and it makes sense, again, that some religious believers, uh, at least, might have higher levels of escape acceptance might look around and say, this world is broken in various ways. Um, so again, we see that religious believers are higher on approach acceptance than escape acceptance than non-believers. There is a third kind of acceptance, and I know this is cutting the pie awfully thin, but this is called neutral acceptance. And here you can see there is no difference. These bars are exactly, well, close to exactly the same height. It does not seem to make a difference whether you are a believer or a non-believer in terms of your neutral acceptance. Neutral acceptance is resignation. People who practice neutral acceptance say death is a part of life, nothing I can do to stop it, so might as well just not worry about it and accept it. And again, no difference here, and that makes sense, right? Religious belief should not have a lot to do with that. So it makes sense that believing or not believing doesn't make a difference here. So I think the lesson that we can learn from this information that I've presented is we have to take a more nuanced view than simply asking the question that everybody wants to ask, which is, is religion good? Right? Is God good? I think we need to say, is religion good for what? For what kind of outcome? We need to be a little more sophisticated than simply saying religion good or bad, right? And I'll present a little more nuanced view as we go along. So we've been talking about uh, uh, fear of death, death anxiety. Let's talk about grief. Does having some form of religious belief, uh, as opposed to none, matter for grief? So we asked people, if they lost somebody in their life during the last 10 years. And then we ask them questions about their grief. Um, of note, I need to say that 10 years is a wide range. And on average, people have lost that person four and a half years ago. So this is not hot as fire current grief. This is grief, this is lingering grief that has remained for a few years. And we all know that grief softens over time. So what we're really asking is, does religious belief versus not, does it make a difference for how much grief you're sort of left with at the end of your grief process, how sad you continue to be? And of course, we hypothesize that people who have religious belief would have a sort of easier time with grief. They would have less lingering grief from an important loss. And that's exactly what we find. Again, not a huge difference, but it's very real. Uh, and that is, is that people with no belief have significantly higher grief levels uh, on average four and a half years later than people with a religious belief. Another uh, dimension of grief you might be interested in is what's called grief-related growth. So it turns out grief is, of course, painful, and people suffer a lot as a result of a loss. But in addition to that, sometimes people grow as a result of grief. So through grief, people realize a new philosophy of life. They appreciate life more. They may reconsider their values or choose a different path in life. They may deepen in their relationships to others or in their relationship to their own spirituality or to God. These are all forms of personal growth that can happen through grief. And that's something that we, we kind of want. We, we want that to happen if we can. So grief isn't just a terrible experience. And what we find is, is that religious believers are significantly, and this is a very large difference, difference significantly higher on grief-related growth. They tend to grow more as a result of than people who profess, in our sample at least, no belief. No so, so far we see that religious and spiritual belief is associated with somewhat lower grief and increased grief-related growth, as well as greater positive acceptance of death. But these differences, these results in you aren't real big. I mean, they're pretty small. They're real, but they're small. And it doesn't answer the more specific question that I talked about at the beginning, which is, don't the, specific, don't the specifics of belief matter? Different people who are, who are religious believers believe different things. It's possible to imagine some of those beliefs being comforting and some of those beliefs being not as comforting. So let's take a look at that. Let's zoom in on just the religious believers. 
These are just the people in our sample, the half of our sample that say, yes, I'm a believer. And let's look at the specifics of their belief and whether those matter. So one thing that might matter for, say, death anxiety or grief and loss is your view of God, right? It's possible different people see God differently. Some people see God as loving and caring and forgiving and sort of squishy and warm and close to them. And other people might see God on the other extreme, being cold or distant or not caring, or even judgmental and condemning and cruel, right? And it makes sense that these two views would have different effects um, of how you cope with uh, death. There are two views of God that we measured in our assessment packet. Uh, these are both dysfunctional views of God. We didn't measure functional views. We measured dysfunctional views. Those are the uh, psychological instruments that were available. Uh, and these two views are an avoidant view of God and an anxious view of God. <laughs> so if you see uh, God as avoidant, you see God as impersonal, distant, and with little or no interest in your life. Uh, people who see God this way believe that God just doesn't care very much. Um, so a typical thing you might hear someone say is, God seems to have little or no interest in my personal life. Uh, another dysfunctional view of God is an anxious view of God, a, a view of God that makes the believer anxious. Uh, and this is the idea that God seems inconsistent or fickle, sometimes warm and responsive, sometimes not. Uh, be, not being sure, in other words, if God is loving or caring, or on the other hand, or on the other hand, perhaps cruel or vindictive or judgmental. Right? Just not knowing. Um, so something you might hear someone say is God sometimes seems very warm and other times very cold. So it makes sense that if a person held higher levels of these dysfunctional views, that they might be more afraid of death, personally. So the results that I'm about to give you in the, in the rest of my slides are all about fear of death. If you're interested in the stuff about uh, grief and loss, uh, you can email me and I will send it to you. But because of lack of time, I'm going to sort of zoom in on the fear of death here. So is this the case that people who uh, hold dysfunctional views of God, avoid or anxious views, tend to be more afraid of death? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, so here we see fear of death, and we see that the people who hold a low anxiety view of God, in other words, people who see God as forgiving and warm, um, tend to have a lower fear of death than people who see God as potentially cruel, vindictive, and judgmental. Um, now, it doesn't look like I changed the slide, but I just did, because the results are almost exactly the same. I think they're one point off, uh, or point one points off. Uh, and that is people who hold a low avoidant view of God, who see God as warm and close, uh, they tend to have lower levels of fear of death people who hold a view of God as distant or cold or uninterested. And that makes a lot of sense. I want to talk about one last kind of dimension of belief that we might be interested in. Um, and this is what's called religious orientation. For decades, psychologists have studied religion through the lens of, of religious orientation. And religious orientation falls, between, uh, falls on a spectrum between two extremes. Extrinsic religion on the one hand, and intrinsic religion on the other. Let me just tell you what these mean, because they're weird terms. Um, if you are an extrinsically religious person, you believe that religion is a means to other ends. So in other words, you go to church, not because you think church is important, but because it's a good opportunity to meet people. Or you're religious, not because religion is that important, but because it elevates your status in the community, or it helps you to connect with your sickness. Okay? There's nothing really wrong with extrinsic religiosity. It's simply seeing religion not as an end in itself, but as a means to other ends that you value more. Okay? And then there is, on the other side of the spectrum, there is intrinsic religiosity. And this is treating religion as an end in itself. Right? So you really live your religion. Religion is important in itself. It's not a means to other ends. It's an end in itself. So we would expect people who, have, who test higher in intrinsic religiosity who truly live according to their religion to be less afraid of dying, right? to have less death anxiety. If you truly live according to your religion, you shouldn't be afraid of dying, or at least not as afraid as if you're not living according to your religion. And that's exactly what we find. So here's fear of death. In this graph, people who are low in intrinsic religiosity have significantly higher, this is a pretty big difference, 
uh, fear of death than people who are high in the intrinsic religion, who really live according to their religion, whatever that religion is. Um, and here's our old friend approach acceptance, so the positive acceptance of death and mortality. We are mortal and that's okay with us. And we find that, again, the people who are truly intrinsic in their religiosity tend to have higher uh, positive acceptance of death. So I just want to sort of summarize and tie it up with a bow for you all. I mean, what we're finding is uh, religious belief does seem to matter, both in terms of death anxiety and experience of grief. That's what we're at least finding preliminarily in this national sample. The relationships, however, aren't always enormous. <coughs> I mean, they are statistically reliable, but they're not that big. Um, and even among believers, the specifics of those beliefs seem to matter. And there are a lot of surveys, a lot of questions that I didn't report the data on. So where we're going to go in the future is to investigate those specifics more. What specifics really matter for grief and acceptance of death? Uh, and hopefully we will publish something on this in the future. Um, with that said, I am going to uh, pass this back to Rob to talk about some of the philosophical implications here. Okay. So, one thing you might criticize us for is attacking a straw man. That is to say, a belief nobody actually holds. So, the view that we've been attacking, or at least providing evidence against, is what you might call naive metaatheism. So, according to naive metaatheism, Professed religious belief should make no difference whatsoever to any of your behaviors or any of your attitudes. In some ways, it's a nice view because it's very easy to test, very easy to understand. But it's also a pretty implausible view, and there's some evidence against it that shows it to be implausible. But here's the thing, there's a different kind of meta-atheism you can take, which I'm going to call nuanced meta-atheism. Here's a quote from George's Ray, where he talks about nuanced meta-atheism. So, he seems to go back and forth a bit between which of the two he believes, but let's just say this is the one he mainly believes. He writes, all I want to claim is that for most contemporary adults in our culture, there is some level at which they know very well the religious stories are false, even if they manage to get themselves to believe, avow, defend, and even die for them on the surface. Moreover, there may be further levels at which they also do believe in God. It's enough for my purposes that there is a significant level at which they believe it's false. A level that, I will argue, is betrayed by a number of peculiarities of much ordinary religious thought. So, here's that quote reduced to three claims. First, nuanced meta-atheism holds that people who avow belief in God actually do believe in God on some level. However, they also disbelieve in God on a significant level. And finally, the people who avow belief in God are self-deceived about the fact that they also disbelieve in God on a significant level. So in other words, yeah, okay, a lot of people kind of believe in God, but they kind of more don't believe in God. And they don't know that they kind of more don't believe in God. So that's the nuanced meta-atheism. Now, how should we respond to nuanced meta-atheism? So here's what we say so far. First of all, it's difficult to understand exactly what the nuanced meta-atheist is saying. What does it mean to disbelieve in God on a significant level? So can you be a meta-atheist, or sorry, can meta-atheism be true if people disbelieve in God on a significant level but also believe in God on a significant level? Just what does it mean to disbelieve and believe at the same time? Those are questions I'd want them to help me answer. But I think what Ray would say, based on some of the other stuff he says in his paper, is that for it to be true that the theist believes in God on a significant level, there should be massive differences between the theist and the atheist. And our results don't show massive differences. So, basically, our results just confirm nuanced meta-atheism. They don't uh, disconfirm it. But now he's starting to get back to what looks like a kind of naive meta-atheism again. Because now he's saying that, okay, to truly believe something, there have to be these massive differences between people. And if you don't have it, then you don't really, really believe. You, you really believe, but you don't really, really believe. So 
That's one response to meta-atheism. I don't quite understand what it's saying. How exactly do we confirm or disconfirm this nuanced meta-atheism? But second of all, why would he believe nuanced meta-atheism? And I'm going to give one of the reasons he holds, or sorry, he provides for believing nuanced meta-atheism. So here it is. He says, contrast the reactions in two situations of a young, loving, uh -oh, believing couple. I, I remember that much. Okay, got it. A young, loving, believing couple who are each seriously ill. In the first, the wife has to be sent off to a luxurious convalescent hospital for care for two years before the husband can come and join her for an indefinite time thereafter. In the second, the wife is about to die, and the husband has been told that he will follow in two years. If, in the second case, there really were the genuine belief in a heavenly afterlife that, let us suppose, they both avow, why shouldn't the husband feel as glad in the first case? Indeed, even gladder, given the prospect of eternal bliss. So what he's saying is this. Imagine two couples. One of them uh, is they have to be separated for two years. The wife has to go to a convalescent home, but the husband is told, don't worry, you'll join her in two years. The other one, the wife dies, but the husband is said, by, told by the doctor, good news, you're going to die in two years too. <laughs> then you get to spend the afterlife with her. According to Ray, the second couple should be just as happy as the first couple. Just like the husband did not grieve in the first case, he should not grieve in the second case if he really did believe in an afterlife, a pleasant afterlife. But I think it doesn't take too much thinking to realize there are pretty significant differences between these two cases. For instance, you can Skype somebody in a convalescent home. Harder to do that for somebody in heaven. Right? So you actually can see the person to some degree when they're separated from you for two years. So you're not exactly mourning, you're not sort of believing, hey, I'm, I'm never going to see them again until two years pass. I will get to see them in the intervening two years. I can even read letters, we can have phone calls. There's all sorts of ways to have contact. I submit that if there was no contact for two years, that actually would be a kind of big deal. I think there would be a kind of grief that you're not going to see your spouse for two years. But second of all, um, he seems to be under the impression that uh, I'm just going to talk about the religion I know best, Christianity, that Christians all believe that everybody goes to heaven no matter what, and they all know this, and they're, they're as convinced of that as they are convinced that I'm talking into a microphone. That Christians have such uh, deep faith, that they all think they have such deep faith, that belief in God, belief in the afterlife is just as strong as belief in this, uh, I think it's Pope, it could be a lecture, I don't know. Regardless, I think that's not a good representation of how Christians actually understand themselves. There's a lot of talk in the Christian tradition about faith being difficult, about faith being a gift. It can be hard. There are doubts. And I do think that uh, people who believe in God, who believe in an afterlife, don't believe in it perhaps as strongly as they say believe that chairs and tables exist. That's not surprising. But that doesn't mean they don't believe in these things. Let me give you another example. I think we act against all sorts of belief systems that we accept. So take environmentalism. There are a number of people who are very concerned about global warming. And they do things to show their concern. They recycle. Maybe they drive an electric car. Maybe they're vegetarians. But there's probably a lot of things they also do continue doing, even though they know it will contribute to global warming. They might use their air conditioner. They might drive their car. It would be really odd to say, oh, so it turns out you don't believe in global warming. Right? That's not the response you give when somebody acts against what you'd expect them to do based on their belief system. You'd have to understand why aren't they living up to it. And sometimes it's really, really difficult. It's hard to go without air conditioning in the San Fernando Valley. I tried it for two minutes once. <laughs> it, was, it was hell, man. So um, I think fundamentally that the meta-atheists, at least meta-atheists of the sort that Ray represents, just have the wrong sort of response to the evidence. It shouldn't be, you don't believe this. It should be, OK, you do believe this, but what's the source of difficulty? So now, here are some yellow balls. Thank you. <laughs> so we are open. I think this is the time when, we ask, when you can ask us questions. So we are open to answering questions about either aspect of our work, the philosophical side or the, uh, the actual evidence side. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go here. Yes. Do you have any data on belief 
based on religion, which I would suspect that the belief that the Christians would be different from, from uh, Muslims, from Jews, and so forth? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, we don't. We didn't ask specifically what religion are you. The reason that we didn't is that there is probably two or three decades of research in the psychology of religion that shows that denomination actually doesn't matter for most outcomes. Um, because there's actually more in common across religions than there is difference. So for instance, you have Muslims who are intrinsically religious and Muslims who are extrinsically religious. You have Muslims that believe God is more caring. You have Muslims that believe God is more distant. You also have Christians who are intrinsically religious and extrinsically religious, and Christians who believe God is more caring versus more distant. Um, and, and probably whether you're intrinsically or extrinsically religious, or whether you, you believe God is cold versus caring, probably makes a bigger difference than what denomination you call yourself. That's what, in general, the psychological research has shown over the last three decades. And so we didn't ask specific questions about denomination because generally it's agreed upon, in, in psychology at least, that denomination doesn't matter as much as the specifics of the beliefs within those denominations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, differences in age matter? For example, a 19 year old probably feels pretty immortal anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and if someone gets older and they see their parents dying and themselves aging, you know, these kinds of issues. Yeah, totally. That is the reason we asked about age. And you, you got me in, in a pickle here because, because I just analyzed the data two days ago to present to you all, we haven't analyzed all of it. So one of the things we really want to do is, is look and see if these relationships are different in different age groups. So is it the case that religion has a greater or lesser influence in, in older adults, say, than younger adults? Uh, what we do know from past research is that uh, fear of death, death anxiety, tends to be pretty low in youth and increase in middle age and then decrease somewhat in old age, which is very interesting. Because I think people come to kind of terms with it uh, and grow a little more comfortable with it. So we would analyze the data with that sort of idea in mind. But it's a really good point. I, I wish I had an answer for you. I will probably in a, in a couple of months. Uh, turns out the data analysis of a data set of this size, um, there are, we have over 2,000 thousand variables, believe it or not, in this data set. It's ridiculous once we sort of figure them in different ways. Uh, it turns out that's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> so we're, we're taking it slow. I would make a really distinction between fear of death and fear of dying. I think those are two different things. Because the people that I encounter of faith are not afraid of death because they'll say something like, I know where I'm going. Right. But just about everybody is afraid of dying. And from the Good point. Um, in terms of, gosh, what was the first one saying? Oh, fear of death versus fear, fear, of, death. fear of dying. So I've, I've done a lot of work clinically with people who are dying, hundreds of people who are dying. And uh, generally speaking, I do find that the real fear is not about death. Uh, that is what happens to me after I die, either my physical body or my spiritual being. The fear is oftentimes about will I suffer? Uh, will I suffocate to death uh, in the case of lung problems? Um, you know, what will this be like? Will I be alone? Will there be people who support me? Will I, will my mind go, et cetera? Um, I had limited time to present to you, but actually we have measures on both of those, fear of dying and fear of death. And we actually find that the relationships are similar. Um, that's the reason I just reported the fear of death. Um, that in fact, you do see differences. All the differences that I showed you having to do with fear of death, we also find for fear of dying. I can't explain why they look similar, but, but they, because I would think it would be greater for fear of dying too, but we're finding at least similar relationships. I don't think people know what their views of death are and fear of dying. 
And that could be too, yeah, that, that, that people aren't making the fine distinction that you are and that I am, and that they're just sort of answering about dying and death in general as one sort of thing. Yeah, and that's one reason why it might be good, again, to, to go with what you said back there, to separate the age groups and see if we have more nuanced uh, results in, say, the people who are over the age of 30 versus under the age of 30, or, or over the age of 30. Under the age of 30. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. It's very hard to get access to hospice samples because not surprisingly, hospice nurses and hospice workers are very, uh, defend their patients and don't want researchers coming in and poking and prodding. Um, I've done some research in hospice and it's a delicate situation, but that would be a great way to go as a researcher, for sure. So regarding the second part of your question about um, being sort of looking forward to seeing your loved one again while at the same time feeling profound grief, I think that um, that they're, they're entirely compatible, like you said, and that um, it might, I think that they're, they're compatible for people in the West and for people in the East. And that um, certainly one thing I think some sort of devout Christians, Jews, Muslims might say is that uh, they might be strong believers in providence, right? That God has a plan. And not only providence, but that um, God has made the world in such a way that there are certain natural reactions you are supposed to have to certain kinds of things. And that grief is a natural reaction that you're supposed to have to death, right? Death does represent a loss for you, even if there is going to be a time when there is a sort of re-encounter, um, it is still, you know, the appropriate response. It's kind of the way you, you show the significance of the person. Um, so I think that um, that some of Ray's sort of predictions about how he thinks people should act are often due to kind of unfamiliarity with devoutly religious people, who isn't surprising me given that he's a philosopher and about 72% uh, of philosophers are atheists. So uh, probably most of his peers are just as bewildered as he is by religious behavior. Um, so yeah, so I could say a little bit more, but I think I'll let him keep on going. Yeah, my sense is the meta-atheist belief wants to force the dualism, and, and I think that the Rob and I are arguing that maybe it's not so. Uh, I think I said. A quick comment and a question, a comment. If you want a great example of escape acceptance, look at Spartacus. Film. Oh. There's a great conversation about that in the film. Oh, cool. uh, the question, did you look at any of the specifics of theology? I think you didn't, but as you were talking, I thought to myself, well, if Jesus, who we say is, became incarnate, he emptied himself, Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus, scared silly of either dying or death, the agony in the garden. So, gee, it didn't make any difference for him. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> let that stand. Good point. Really interesting question. I mean, 
mean, there are so many fascinating things to investigate here. And there's, there's some, but there's shockingly little research uh, on, this, on this topic. No, we didn't specifically. We do ask, we do have a questionnaire that asks about belief in the afterlife. And that generally makes the assumption that the afterlife is a at least reasonably pleasant thing. Um, and what we do find, I didn't present the data here, is that belief in the afterlife, stronger belief that an afterlife exists, is associated with lower levels of, of um, avoidance of death and lower levels of death anxiety. Um, and I believe, although I may be lying to you, that I analyzed that with regard to grief and found that belief in an afterlife also means modestly lower levels of grief in the experience of loss. We didn't look at like hell specifically. Yeah, I mean there there are questions of there are questionnaires of these things, but we didn't want to. One of the problems you always get into as a social science researcher is you don't want to overtax your participants because what happens if you ask three hours worth of questions is they start just going yes, no, yes, no, yes, and don't actually read them. And so I tend to think the sweet spot is about a half hour, and once I get to that, I stop asking questions. And so uh, the great thing is, is that keeps us in business because we can do more research. I, I want to say a little bit about that. Um, that struck me a lot too, not, not so much in, in Dave's uh, method, but in, in Ray's sort of presupposition that belief in religion means belief in God and also means believe that you and all your loved ones are going to heaven. So I'm Roman Catholic. I feel incredibly presumptuous saying for sure I'm going to heaven. I don't know. I, I sure hope I'm going to purgatory. <laughs> That's the best I can do. Um, I, I'm a, I'm, I think the, the term is I'm a hopeful universalist. I hope everybody will go to heaven, but I can't say for sure that that is the case. And I think, and this is something I've never mentioned a day before. It's not a personal revelation. Uh, it's uh, there, there's there's sociologist at Notre Dame named Christian Smith, who's done some very interesting work about a phenomenon he calls moralistic therapeutic deism, mm -hmm. and he thinks moralistic therapeutic deism, or just Oprahism in short, is kind of the religion of the nation. And basically, it means if you're a good person, you go to heaven. God is basically a cosmic butler who is supposed to do stuff for you. And if he doesn't, you have a right to get mad at him. But that pretty much only bad people go to hell, and the only kind of bad people are basically Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer, and maybe Hitler's dog, right? And that's basically it. And it, that kind of view, I wouldn't be at all surprised if a lot of people espouse that simply because it's something they think they're supposed to espouse, and they don't really know what they believe. And so many of these might be true of that. Maybe you could have metadeism or something like that. Nobody's actually a therapeutic deist, but um, that would be you know, a lot of stuff. And I think that gets to the to the to the point that, that I was making with my second sort of question, which is, you know, saying I'm a believer versus not a believer, it is really dualistic. And, and and I think we need to say, well, what what are the specifics of your belief? Like what does that mean for you? Because I can imagine that some beliefs really are more comfortable than others, which we provide some evidence. I'm not a neuroscientist, and I don't pretend to be. It's just way too much for me to learn. Um, uh, but um, I have faith in you. Dave. But um, <laughs> um, do you really believe that? So, <laughs> but I think I think appealing to the idea of dual processes that we that we really do have an emotional sense and we have a logical sense, and and the way that we are sort of evolved as human beings is that those things are somewhat separate, and and that they sort of came into existence somewhat separately loosely linked as, as systems, as mental systems, that we will definitely comment on. And I think that does partly explain how you can at once truly believe something, because belief is more cognitive, right? And at the same time, feel something else 
Um, though I think the people who, who really study attitudes and beliefs more than I do would say that beliefs do have an emotional component. And you don't really truly believe something unless the emotion's there as well. Um, but we would have to sort of get into the nuances of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, so that there are there is that data too. I haven't analyzed it yet. I'm, I can't wait to because I think that's really interesting. What I have analyzed, I did analyze it in a very gross sense, and I found it's very interesting. I found that religion makes more of a difference regarding your own death, fear of your own death, than it does fear of other people's death. Apparently, we're just not very afraid of other people dying, um, as, as as opposed to, and the level of fear was different as well. Um, but I think we need. I don't want to say too much about that because I think we still need to do analyses, more analyses. One more question, if there is. Yeah? I was almost just done with it. So we're oh, very uh, sensitive questions. Sure, of course, for good reason. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I noticed was there was a lot of people who believed it wasn't just the death of a loved one, but it was also uh, the end of an identity. Sure. And I'm curious if any of your research looked at the different kinds of grief and loss um, that are related together. Yeah, so the instrument that we use to measure grief is uh, the TRIG. Texas, boy, Texas Reactivity Index of Grief or something like that. Um, and it's a very widely used measure. And unfortunately, it doesn't get into the specifics of are you grieving the personal loss of that person? Are you grieving, grieving the loss of your own role? Are you grieving the end of an era of your life? Uh, it also doesn't make distinction. What we, all it basically does is say, Past grief, it measures retrospective grief. So during the actual active loss, were you grieving? And then now, in present day, are you grieving? That's the only two things it measures, and in a very gross way. It does ask individual questions about those things, but when you go to score the instrument, it just adds them up. Um, so we could look at the individual items, but that's not, research methods wise, that's not, it's not a great scientific thing to do. But you're bringing up, really, I mean, as, as we can see from these questions and, and of our discussions, this is an endlessly complex topic. And, and that's why it's fun, I think, as a philosopher and a psychologist to, to sort of play around in it, because there's a, a lot of really important things to address. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave and Rob. I um, have to say the uh, Jewish writer, Elie Wiesel, says in the beginning of his book, Night, the human race is himself to God by the questions they asked. The deep questions that you've uh, asked us today, I think, have really raised our own deep questions about uh, God's presence in our life. Like Rob, I'm hoping for purgatory, but I also bank on the promise that the Lord God makes to Moses where he says, I will be with you. And um, I think that that can be a, a real blessing for all of us. I want to thank you all for your participation here. Thank you all for coming. The evaluations in the middle of the table are always very, very helpful for us in the Ignatian Center. So if you could just take a few moments, fill those out before you leave, we'd really be grateful for that. And I would now just like again to thank um, Rob and Dave one more time. Uh, for being